As a diabetic, exercise is supposed to be good for us, but sometimes it feels like blood sugars just don't want us to exercise. At least for me. See, blood sugar chaos used to get in the way of all of my workouts. I'd spike high and then crash. I'd take insulin for a high blood sugar, give a correction, it wouldn't work. The next day I'd go low and wouldn't come back up. It felt like every single day was so unpredictable that it was just impossible to actually control. And I was better off just staying home alone on the couch. <laughs> it seemed impossible to actually control blood sugars through exercise. Now, see, that was at least until I started looking for patterns and approaching it from a formula-driven side. See, when I opened my mind to formulas, there was more predictability. I finally discovered a way to not only get through a workout, to actually exercise and gain the benefits of fitness, but to also do so with blood sugars that were controlled and steady at non-diabetic numbers. Now, if you don't know who I am, I'm somebody who's maintained above a 90% time and range for over five and a half years straight. I train for Ironmans. I'm also a certified master fitness trainer and nutritionist, but most importantly, I am also a type one diabetic. Now, my name's Matt and I do experiment on myself so that you don't have to. And I truly hope that you find this one useful as we break down the three biggest patterns that I've found with myself and with type one clients that I work with to unravel the mysteries behind exercise and diabetes so that you don't have to worry about the crashes or the spikes, you can actually enjoy the workouts themselves. Now, pattern number one is the pre-workout spike trap. Now, I don't mean pre-workout as the caffeinated pump you up kind of a drink that a lot of people have beforehand, and I'd be lying if I didn't say I had that a few times in college as well to try to get really amped up for a good workout. But instead, the pre-workout habits, so the things that happen before the workout, all right, so oftentimes, as someone living with diabetes, we're recommended to eat a snack if you want to exercise. There's two big problems with that, though, is that if you have a snack, number one, it's not measured, it's very generic. There is no telling if a snack is five carbs, 15 carbs, 30 carbs, you name it. And so there needs to be more specificity behind the snack, which you can't understand until you know your blood sugar formulas. But number two, and this is actually more important initially, is that depending on the type of exercise you're about to perform, you actually might need insulin and not a snack. Reason being is that anaerobic activity like weightlifting can actually lead to a blood sugar spike and you might need to take insulin to avoid the spike and stay in range. See, I used to actually have to take two units of insulin just to get through a workout. I would take two units manually, I'd hop on the treadmill for 10 minutes as a warm up, I'd go lift weights, and then by the end of the workout, I get to be rewarded by a little snack. And that was, you know, five carbs, 10 carbs. Finally, blood sugars would start coming back down. And in the absence of those two units, not that that's how much you're supposed to take, this is not medical advice, I'm just sharing some stories, but in the absence of taking those two units, I would end up at 200 plus my blood sugars, right? So oftentimes the, the challenge here is that people are unaware and untrained ultimately of what exercise can do to blood sugars. Most time cardio leads to a drop. Most time anaerobic intense weightlifting type exercises can lead into a spike, but everyone's a little bit different. So you do have to kind of experiment for yourself to find that one out. Now to be complete with this point, I do want to help you understand the pre-workout spike that a lot of people have from a snack. So if you are gonna go for a jog, garden, run errands, hop on the treadmill, whatever type of aerobic activity you're thinking of, aerobic meaning a steady state activity, and uh, typically that's going for a run, going for a jog. But if it is something that you anticipate dropping from and seeing blood sugars lower, you want to have a snack. The challenge though is we don't know how much of a snack, when to have it, or what type of snack. So there's three things to consider there. When do I eat it? Is it right before? Is it an hour before? Is it a meal before? What type of snack is the type of food? Am I going to have six eggs? Am I gonna have a glucose tablet? Am I gonna have a small meal? What's the strategy there? And number three is the amount. Do I need five carbs, 10 carbs, 20 carbs? What is the volume of the snack? Now, once you get those dialed in, there's still one final piece, and that is your lagging indicator. When you first eat, you don't see a spike instantaneously unless it's a glucose tab, right? So if you chose a snack that's higher in proteins, fibers, or fats, you're gonna see slower digestion rates, which means you might see it start to rise, and then it levels out during your workout, and at the end of your workout, you end up spiking. Let me know in the comments if that's ever happened to you because that used to be my constant. I used to think that exercise made me spike, 
right? Point A, point B. I exercise and then I spike. Totally forgot that I had a snack beforehand and that during the exercise I was burning enough glucose to stabilize things. Digestion being a little bit slower during exercise like that as well. And then as soon as I stopped burning the glucose with the exercise, digestion would resume and blood sugars would take off. That is a huge challenge. Simply means there was too much food. So if I had 20 carbs, like a medium sized apple, and I worked out and I was level, and then as soon as I stopped working out and it spiked, it might just be that my apple was too big. I need to cut it in half, try 10 carbs next time, right? So there is this constant iteration or experimentation that has to take place with your own blood sugars because we are all so different. And of course, different workout tiles styles, types, durations, goals, and everything. So when I was training for an Ironman, I could consume hundreds of grams of carbs throughout a 10 hour workout because it was a 10 hour workout. <laughs> it was insane. So depending on the style, duration, intensity, and many other factors, you may or may not need a large snack, small snack, any snack at all, but it's important to consider that if you do snack and you see that it's level during your workout and spikes afterwards, that might be why. Bring it back to point A, root cause starts with the snack. Pattern number two is the correction spiral. You ever head to the gym, you're a little bit higher than you'd like to be? I've certainly been there, 200, 210. Take a correction of insulin, hop into the gym, and then before you know it, your blood sugars fall through the floor because you've crashed. You quick have some sugar because you're in the middle of a workout and you try and bring yourself back up. Too high, have to give more insulin. Ah, we're on the blood sugar roller coaster. It's official. See, this is one of the challenges is that exercise can actually speed up the effects of insulin. Your circulation is improved, but you're also burning glucose as well independently of the insulin, which means you've got two lowering impacts on your blood sugars acting at the same time and acting faster than you typically see. So when I gave a correction at 210, went and hopped on the treadmill, and 10 minutes later was at 90. Whew, 120 points dropped in 10 minutes is insane. It's no wonder I felt like I was gonna pass out. See, when we exercise with insulin on board, it can introduce an entirely new set of variables and it makes it a lot more complicated. So not to say that you shouldn't give insulin when you exercise. Like I said in tip number one, you actually might need insulin depending on the type, duration, and intensity of the exercise itself. However, if you anticipate the exercise dropping you, and you have insulin on board, either from a correction or from a previous mealtime dose, that insulin on board is about to be supercharged. And you really need to be cautious with that. That honestly has been the leading cause of frustration with my own blood sugars. Whenever I have even a fraction of a unit of insulin on board and I go for a run, I fall through the floor. I crash so hard. I can't eat fast enough to bring it up. I have to stop the workout. I go back home and just kind of cancel my plants because it's ruined. So insulin on board, one of the biggest factors here. Now, when you exercise, there is still a need for insulin. You can't just exercise your diabetes away. I wish I've tried. <laughs> it's, it's kind of the journey to Ironman was for me. Uh, but when you have insulin on board, it tends to go a lot further than it typically does, at least in my experience. So what I've found, honestly, through one kind of a scary experience where in the middle of one of my Ironman training sessions, I did a big bike ride and then a big run right afterwards. A couple hours into it, I was at 180. I gave a tenth of a unit of insulin. And within 10 minutes, I was at 80. Ooh. That was terrifying, honestly. Um, I actually called my family and I was like, I might need you to pick me up because I didn't know if I was gonna make it. So understanding that a 10th of a unit dropped me 100 points. I don't know what your correction factors are, but mine, typically I would need over a unit to do that. So that's insane, right? Understanding how much further insulin can go gives you kind of a tip or a heads up to be a bit more cautious with it if you were to introduce it. Uh, and of course, when it starts to work faster, you gotta catch it earlier. So I saw it was at 80. I was aggressive in treating that drop because it was dropping rapidly. I wasn't gonna wait until I was 40 to start treating with glucose. And micro treatments taken earlier can be very helpful, very beneficial in avoiding the blood sugar roller coaster 
even starting. Pattern number three that I see with myself and with clients is the recovery gap. See, when we exercise, we're actually improving insulin sensitivity in addition to burning glucose, which is kind of cool. So especially during cardio type activities, when we exercise, we are lowering our blood sugars because our body needs to burn energy to move, right? But in addition to that, when we have exercised, it puts our body in more of an insulin sensitive state, especially true with anaerobic like weightlifting because you are using your muscles. If you think of your muscles like a giant sponge, right? When you work out, you squeeze the sponge, which can squeeze out some glucose. It's in the form of muscle glycogen. So right now, if you were to just flex your muscle, you can do that because there is stored energy in your muscle ready to be used, right? So when you work out, that might be part of the reason you might see some blood glucose excursions when you're lifting heavy things because your muscles are squeezing out glucose. However, and that's in addition to counter regulatory hormones, liver dump, adrenaline, all kinds of stuff can come into play. But that science is for a different lesson. Let me know if you want to hear more about that. However, when you squeeze that glucose out of your muscle, afterwards, after you've broken down that muscle tissue, your muscles want to soak glucose back up to store for next time and to repair themselves. So this is part of the reason you are in a hyper insulin sensitive state after big workouts. So here's the trick though. After a workout, you need a recovery meal. You need to replenish those glycogen stores. You need to give your body nourishment, right? To recover from a hard training session or even just going for a jog, you know, just get some food into your system. The challenge here is that in a more insulin sensitive state, you may not need as much insulin as you typically do. And if people don't know that, they can put themselves in a very dangerous circumstance. See, I actually had a, a few friends of mine who were also type one Ironman athletes. One of them, after her first Ironman, went to eat breakfast, pulled back on her dose by about 30%, so she didn't take all of her insulin, knowing that after a full Ironman, which this is a 140.6 mile race that we do, after that big race, very insulin sensitive, muscles are gonna soak up glucose, so she pulled back on her insulin dosing. And thinking she did the right thing, went ahead and had breakfast, and wouldn't you know it, within minutes, urgent low, she thought for sure she was gonna die. That is the power of exercise, okay? So when we get a good workout in, we have to be very cautious after the workout, especially if it's a new workout in both intensity and or duration. So if it's something you've not done in a while, or if you're starting to ramp up training, like you're trying to do progressive overloads to build muscle, or if you're doing longer distances each week for endurance training, anything that's new or longer, you might have to consider a reduction of insulin in both the amount and in the timing. So for me, I reduce my pre-bolus time and I reduce my bolus insulin because once you give insulin, you can't take it back. So I can always add a second dose later if it wasn't enough, if I'm uncertain. But again, you heard me say in the beginning, I prefer certainty wherever possible and predictability comes from blood sugar formulas. It's the only way to do it so that you can actually calculate the numbers behind it. This is what I work with my clients on. We call it the 80-20 blood sugar formula where there are literal calculations behind how much insulin sensitivity I gain from different types of workouts or how many carbs I need per 30 minutes of running, right? Or how much insulin I need per hour of weightlifting. There are formulas for all of these things and they're waiting to be discovered for you. And once I understood these formulas, these patterns that were emerging, right, which you can find as well, you'll start seeing it the more aware you are of this if you're looking out for these things that I've helped you find today. But once I understood them, my performance skyrocketed. And I mean, honestly, my mental health accelerated as well. It was like, oh, I'm actually seeing hope in life with type 1 diabetes. I, I see a path forward. And I mean, wouldn't you know it, not too long after that, I PR'd my next half marathon in training. I uh, went on, of course, complete half Ironman, full Ironman. But this can also be useful for just trying to lose some weight. You know, a lot of type 1s talk to me about trying to lose the pounds uh, and just getting through a workout effectively without having this blood sugar roller coaster or crashing to the floor and having to eat more calories than you burn. And it feels like you're just losing ground every single time you work out. The trick here is that everything boils down to a calculation and it starts with a pattern. So first you got to identify your patterns. Do you drop or do you rise during workouts? What happens before a workout? What happens after a workout? How, how can I identify these patterns to give me a, a step in the right direction, 
right? So if I know I drop, how much do I drop? If I know I had a snack and it worked, how many carbs were in that snack? Did it have protein? What about fiber and fats, right? So the more details I can get behind this, the more actionable my data becomes and I get to actually start building out these blood sugar formulas like I wrote about in my book, The Blood Sugar Freedom Formula. Don't waste years like I did. You know, trying to figure out blood sugars blindly. There are patterns. Blood sugars are readable. They're trainable. And they are waiting to give you the answers that you're looking for. If you found value here today in this video, I want you to understand that blood sugars can be controlled, but it starts with you getting curious, understanding that every blood sugar exists for a reason, and it's our job to just get curious about what that reason could be. The more curious you are, the more aware you become. The more aware you become, the easier it is to identify patterns. Once you start to identify patterns, you can start putting your blood sugar formulas together to gain more certainty over these pieces of the puzzles like eating your favorite foods, finally losing the weight, or just having mental peace while you get to experience freedom with your diabetes, living in harmony with it, right? As, I don't know, paradoxical as that sounds, it sounds silly, right? Living in harmony with diabetes, it's possible, but you gotta take the right steps. All right, so find your patterns, plug them in, make your formulas. If you need some help, I'm happy to help if I can. I'll put some uh, assistance in the description of this one for you. But if you did like this and you found some value in it, hit the like button, let people know it's worth watching. Drop a comment, let me know what kind of questions you have or what stood out to you. I wanna know what I can make on this platform that'll bring you the most value possible. It's my goal to share what I've learned over the years and to give you access to your formula waiting to be discovered. Your blood sugars are literally leaving you breadcrumb trails with those little dots on your CGMs. If you're wearing one of those like me, it's time for you to interpret that data and turn it actionable so that you can actually start having fun and not letting diabetes hold you back. All right, so hit the subscribe button. We got some more videos coming out along these topics that I think you'll appreciate. And I got a video that'll pop up on screen for you to watch next. We'll see you next time and keep up the fight.